Hey, Kendry. Hi, Sohi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm not bad. Where are you guys living? I was just talking to um, um, when it, your, your first name. I'm just Carly. trying to remember. Carly. Oh, my gosh. Yes, Carly. And uh, where, in Cameroon. Live, where do you guys live in Cameroon? Um, so you know where the target is? No. Okay, well, if you go up Las Posas and then you make a left at Ponderosa, we're right there. We're like 10 minutes from school. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, that's nice. Very yeah, convenient. it is really nice. Have you been there all summer as well? Yeah, I moved in like two Julys ago. So I've been here for a while. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it's wow. Been well, it's been cozy sounds like yeah yeah I'm excited mm -hmm. to come in tomorrow are you yes <laughs> long day tomorrow but I'm excited yeah yeah it'll be interesting actually you just reminded me it's Wednesday and yeah whoever's open we already have our tables out there but hopefully I'll have to talk to Marissa about making sure everything is swept up because there's like like leaf debris all over the place this i don't know if it's the uh, winds mm -hmm. or whatever have you but it'll be nice hey aj hello i have to go in on my phone because my internet just died oh no well no worries it's okay i you know i i ran in here a little bit late only because um i for some reason i thought it was at 11 and not 10 30 so <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine that's fine so I'm glad you're here AJ I'm waiting for Carly actually she signed up oh there's Koa um I didn't know if Carly was gonna she's make it in the wrong room yeah um both Dorothy and Carly are in the room that I was in just the oh, zoom link in okay. the middle of the zoom link oh because there's two links yeah yeah okay so um, as we're getting warmed up here and waiting for them to come in, I want to ask you guys, how much experience have you had tutoring oral presentations so far? Some of you guys may have had very, very little because there's not a lot of opportunity. I'm just curious. I've had none. Zero. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, same here. Okay. Same here, as far as, I'm, as far as I can remember, I haven't had it. Carly, you had no, yeah, I know you're just coming in here. We're just asking what experience you guys had in terms of tutoring oral presentations. Um, I tutored a group presentation. Oh, you did? Yeah. Was it last semester? Yeah. Online? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's cool. How was that like? It was good. It was like, um, I think it was a UNIV class. Yeah. And so it was all freshmen and it was kind of fun and they improved a lot. They just like ran through it with me a couple times, but they did way better the last presentation compared to the first one. So I liked it. Yeah. And a lot of it too is really come, it comes down to them just actually going through it you know, um, and, and, and we will talk about that, how important it is to really do rehearsals and stuff, but you'll see like a lot of the common errors is that they just actually literally did not spend any time actually rehearsing, going through it, whether it's for an individual presentation for, or for a group presentation. So that's kind of like the secret to kind of doing presentations just generally. It's kind of like, you know, if you're, you know, if you're writing a paper or something and you just wrote it one time, didn't even check to see if there's any grammar errors or anything and you just submitted it. You guys know that's a big no-no, right? <laughs> you just don't do that. You don't just like submit a paper without even reading it a second time, right? And that's what they're doing. They're just submitting a, you know, their presentation without even running through. And it, it's even worse when it's a group because... <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what they're, each other is saying, right? So there's sometimes there's overlap and, you know, sometimes they contradict each other or there's like one person spends too much time talking or blah, 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 blah. There's always issues. I'm sure, Carly, you've had, you've seen a lot of that. 
so yeah, so if you work with that, that's it. And the other thing that I, you know, it's really important for our workshop today is really talking about in-person versus online. So you guys had a lot of experiences and yours Carly was primarily online, but in-person is a whole different animal. And I was just talking to, um, Kiana about this because she had had some experience tutoring students with oral presentations and you know it's really going to be a huge shift um, people when they present especially online I think in many ways they feel like there's less anxiety because all that people are doing is looking at the screen which is what they want right most people they hate giving presentations they're afraid of it they don't like being called attention to when they're giving it and they don't know what to do with their bodies and now for the first time they're going to have to go back in person and their body's like right there right <laughs> so that's going to create a lot of anxiety and also just awkwardness in general so uh, those are things to kind of think about some of you guys are just strictly doing online like aj you're strictly online but carly and kenzie you guys are going to be in person so there's always a chance that you're going to be working with people in person koa you too very high probability that you might be working with people, especially if you're doing business with people in person. So you got to kind of pay attention to the different dynamics that come into play. And we'll, we'll talk about that too. Um, you know, you know, some of the basics that I usually talk about with oral communications and presentations is really um, the basics of like, what what are the objectives? What are the goals for giving any kind of communication as opposed to giving like very specific rules like you have to do this or you have to do that? Um, although there are some things that I recommend, a lot of it is really some basic issues about like what is the objective for you know designing a slide or delivering a presentation and and that's what we're going to talk about. I think for, we're you know just given the time scale. Um, and because I, I do want to ask you guys questions and stuff like that, we'll probably end up talking a lot more about feedback for online and in person. And then um, the rest of the slide actually goes into talking about like how do you record a presentation online. There are some tips about that. And there's also like technical things about recording in, in one of our rooms that we used to give workshops for. But Shay has said that he's going to individually those of you who are working in person, he's going to individually give you guys a tour of that space and how to use the, the tools, you know, the, like the cameras and things like that. So I think that that's going to be more helpful, probably just looking at how to use that technology when you're seeing it, um, as opposed to me talking about that. Okay. And then, of course, you know, you know, you guys can ask me questions and, and stuff like that. So let me let me get started here. Um, Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. All right, here we go. It's a little more fun. I mean, I didn't mind uh, giving this talk to um, to uh, Kiana, but Kiana was the only person yesterday. And so it's kind of nice to have you guys all here and you guys will have different experiences. So you can, you can always give me feedback. Um, I don't think I gave you guys this presentation. We talked about oral presentations before, right? Um, during our UNIP 299 class, right? And we did, but I don't think I gave you this specific, well, maybe some portions of it I gave. So some of it might be new um, uh, and some of it might be kind of a, a kind of repeat as well. Okay, so let me get, get started on that. So, oh, that, that point here about downloading and stuff like that, I do recommend, I mean, I just, I don't think I have time to go through this whole thing. So I do recommend that you uh, kind of look through it um, later on if you can, um, uh, if, if you have some more extra downtime to go through it because it has a lot of information. Um, I don't know if you're gonna remember all the things that, you're, that I'm gonna tell you, but you always have a reference to go to. Okay, so here's what's happening, right? We had online presentations, it was live. We did, in fact, uh, the WMC used to, about 20% of our, our tutoring used to be kind of oral presentations of some sort, like you know, oral presentations of slideshows or research posters. And that kind of disappeared um, after COVID and we went online, but it's gonna come back again. Um, and it's starting to slowly come back. I've already been requested to give at least three 
uh, workshop presentations for calm. So I just feel like, you know, that is something that I think is starting to come back and we need to be prepared for. So the things that I want to talk about in particular, because you guys have been trained to do online stuff, is thinking about it in person as well. So prioritizing concerns for online and in-person presentations, and then thinking about how to get feedback and possibly recording online and in-person. I probably won't go into the details of the recording, but um, but especially the oral presentation feedback um, online and in-person is going to be good. Um, there are some common issues. Hopefully, we'll have time to kind of talk about it. But you know, you you probably recognize them as well. But common problems that you're going to see that you probably want to be prepared for when you're kind of working with them. And then I have a checklist. So this is what I'm talking about. I might not have time to talk about the feedback form or the online presentation checklist, but you can go through it yourself because it's just a list of stuff. Like, don't forget to go through these things, right? Um, there are some basic stuff that you guys want to pay attention to as tutors when you're giving feedback. So um, I want to get started by just asking about your own experiences. It's, well, I guess you guys haven't tutored oral presentations, but Carly, you know, because you're the one person I think that had that experience. Um, you know, what do you think like in that session, if you can think of that last session you did, what went really well with that? And then what do you wish, I don't know, you could have done better or if you could have done differently if you had that session again? Um, I think something that went well they I don't know if we also do this in person but it was recorded so they really mm -hmm. liked having that um and I recorded a couple of them so they really liked that and then I guess different um I think in person posture and things like that is a really big portion of a presentation and online they're kind of just looking at the screen so I think that will be a really big difference for mm -hmm. tutors. Like we'll focus more on giving feedback on those things. And I couldn't give feedback for that besides like, you know, eye contact really, but other yeah. you know, give feedback to them. You're absolutely right. And I'm really glad you talked about recording because you're right. It's kind of easy because there's just a button where you can just record it and they can watch it again. Um, actually in our studio in 1730, we have a camera and I've actually recommended a lot. And there's some students who say, oh no, I don't want to be recorded. You can just give me the feedback. But I recommend really highly, even if you're not going to record it and give it to your faculty. Sometimes faculty want to see the rehearsals um, or they want a final product, right? And then you have to record it. So like a lot of times with Calm, for example, they used to do a pitch for uh, research posters. So students would be practicing like three or four times and then we choose the best ones to give to their faculty for a grade, right? But a lot of times they can just go in there to rehearse, especially for a group presentation. I would recommend because the camera's there, hey, I could just record it. Why don't you just run through a rehearsal and then we can play it back and see how it goes. And they they like it, right? They do. I mean, they don't love seeing themselves, but they like it because they can really see what's going on and they can even enhance the feedback that you're providing, right? So it's definitely helpful. You can really do that. And I would recommend it if you can, if you have the time to do it, right? Sometimes when you have like a 30 minute session, you might not have that time. If you have a one hour session, you definitely can do that. Okay, I recommend for oral presentations, for oral presentation feedback in particular, that they try to make a re reservation for one hour. 30 minutes is way too short, especially for a group, uh, just because it takes time to set things up, you, you know, camera, you know, and everything else. So I, I definitely recommend an hour. So if you hear, if you're working with students and they're, they want to do a group presentation, they want to see you, you tell them, uh, you know, let's, let's do it for an hour. Um, and, and Carly, you've kind of mentioned like, you know, the difference, I think the, one of the major differences is just physical presence and space. You don't have to worry about like, how do you move around in space <laughs> online because you really don't move, but you're going to have to worry about that uh, when you're in person. And the other thing I was going to say that I think is really important is thinking about um, 
and I think this is something that, you know, I, I don't think that students do very well online is using their voice very effectively. And um, I kind of explain it. I've explained this to Kiana about this. You, in some ways, the students do better with the voice when they're live because they're kind of standing there and they're gesturing and they're kind of animated, right? Because you're, you're in front of somebody. And when you're online, you kind of don't know if you're really in front or you can't really see all their faces. So you don't feel like you have that connection, right? And there's, and, and because of that, they're not fully engaged in that, that presentation and their voice doesn't get animated. And my recommendation to Kiana, when I, when I see that is that um, uh, it's something that I've learned, you know, when I was, I had to do like a, a phone interview a long time ago for a job. And I, I've been told like, don't sit in your pajamas when you're doing that phone interview. Why do you think that is? Like, you don't want to sit in your pajamas while you're doing a phone interview. You just don't feel as professional. It doesn't feel real. Yeah, it's like, you know, um, and the pajamas might just make you kind of lull you into this old like it's it's not serious kind of thing and you're not geared up mentally for it. there is some kind of psychology about that like being ready and prepared and somehow wearing you know a suit or whatever makes you feel like even though you're just doing it on the phone that you're you're mentally prepared and I feel like you know with students too with they're giving the presentations you want to be mentally prepared um, and in your online, you want to do the same thing, like make it feel like it's a presentation, dress up for it or something. I had a student a long time ago when I was teaching at Stanford, she, when she gave a presentation, she'd wear six inch heels. Is it six inch? I don't know. Really high heels. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> what are you doing with that? She's like, it makes me feel like I'm like, you know, something serious, this is unprofessional, you know, and she has a regular sneakers and she just flipped into it and she had like some, something nice that she wore and she gave her presentation and she just did that. And it helped her kind of transform herself, you know, into something more, um, something more, you know, her, her other self or her, her performing self, right? And that, of course, not everyone does that, but but I have to say, I think it does, there is something there about it, you know? So do think about that in terms of like, you know, you know, when we're in front of people, it's not about just giving who you are, like, you know, what is, you, you know, what are you when you're presenting? Um, you're giving your best self, but also a professional version of yourself, right? Um, and a lot of these classes, uh, faculty really want you guys to kind of do a little bit more than just read, right? So that is something to think about. As a tutor, you want to help students achieve that goal. Okay, so the number one thing I wanna talk about is prioritizing. This is something that you do as tutors when you're working on student papers. But how do you do that with oral presentations? How do you help them prioritize, right? So I, you know, I have a couple of recommendations and it's gonna sound familiar, but it should be, right? So you ask about the assignment, but there are certain things that you wanna ask you know, that's a little bit different in like oral presentations than with, uh, you know, uh, paper presentations, right? Or paper essays. Obviously you have to ask, when is it due? How long is the presentation? So instead of page numbers, it's really about like how many minutes, how much time do you have? That's super important. We'll talk about this later about how do you organize a presentation based on time, but how long is that presentation? You know, stage. You know, what stage are you at? Are you at the outline stage, draft stage? Are you previously rehearsed? Did someone give you feedback? Where are you, right? Same thing with writing, but it is important because you wanna make sure that they're at the right timeline, right stage, as they're gonna get something ready to go. Um, it's also important, I didn't write this down, but it's also important to know if they have like an outside client they're presenting to, right? Like Capstone sometimes has to present to community leaders, um, marketing, business. Sometimes they have serious people that they're actually giving presentations to because they have clients and things like that. So that really ups the ante in terms of professionalism and you want to make sure that you, you know what that's about. Hopefully you're going to read the prompt and that's going to help you and they're going to explain. But uh, it is important to get that context to make sure that you're fully giving them the kind of feedback that they need. 
The other thing that sometimes students don't articulate explicitly unless you ask is, is this an individual presentation or a group presentation? I've had students who come in, they're just single, right? One person. And I think it's an individual presentation. And then I realize, oh no, this is a group presentation. Because <laughs> we're going through the slide and it's like, huh, you don't have a beginning and you don't have an end <laughs> what's going on, right? Uh, and then, you know, that's a good opportunity for you to obviously help them, but say, you know what? Do you have the rest of the slides? And maybe you should ask the group to come in because <laughs> you want to make sure you're all like aligned together, right? So yeah, it's really important to kind of figure out what's going on. They don't always tell you. Um, do they need recording? Again, that's just another issue. Like, you know, or do they want to record record with uh, or rehearse with recording? Um, things that you want to talk to them about and you might want to just say what the value of that is. Um, I feel like sometimes like tutors, you guys are kind of like the, the waiter or the waitress in a restaurant. Like here's the special of the day. And you know how you have to kind of really pitch, like you really ought to try this. It's a great dish. It tastes really good with that, you know, or, you know, <laughs> and I, I do feel like, you know, you guys are the experts. So you really, students don't always know what's best for them. And so you, you really do want to kind of make some recommendations. Like, can I recommend that you might want to record while you're rehearsing? Because then you can watch yourself and really see where you're standing and, and all that. And I can give you feedback, but it's, you learn a lot more if you record it. Okay. So those are the kind of things that I want you to start thinking about recommending things so that it would help them improve their presentation. I would just say if they could rehearse, just period. And especially record and rehearse, that would just improve a huge deal, just a huge deal, because nothing is better than you seeing yourself, <laughs> you know, fumbling away, and then you're like, oh my god, I really have to do better, right? Uh, what would uh, what would they like to do during their session? So, you know, obviously you're going to have that conversation as well, but. You know, do they want to review the assignment? You know, you should review the assignment prompt and the requirements just at least quickly, uh, just to see what are the key things. Usually, when I see that, I, I usually have like a notebook or, uh, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, post it or something. I just write that down because I want to make sure that I remember what it is. So as I'm observing, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering, okay, this is some of the key things. Like, for example, like in COM 499. They need to make sure that they integrate theory into their uh, their you know project that they they did. And if I don't hear that, then I know, hey, you're missing that point. Um, so I just want to make sure that you know that's part of my job is to make sure that they're actually following through with the requirements of that prompt, right? So just make notes on that so that you remember. And then if you walk through, you know, you, you know sometimes that they're like nervous and they're like, I'm not ready to give a full rehearsal. You can say, it's okay, you can just walk through it. You don't have to perform, you can just talk about it and they feel a lot better. So sometimes that's good. And then when they feel more comfortable, maybe they'll rehearse or they'll come back and do it later. Uh, you can just review the slideshow for the individual group. That's also possible, just look at the slides. But like I said, just looking at the slides, I mean, that's, slides are just one part of a presentation, right? Uh, you can record the individual presentation or group presentation as well. So, um, so again, ultimately with all things, just like with tutoring, you're gonna prioritize based on when it's due, issues of importance, right? And time. And by time, I mean like um, duration, right? So just like, you know, when you're working with an essay that has to be eight pages long, if you have a presentation that's eight minutes long, but when they're rehearsing, it's going to 15 you're gonna to have to help them with cutting, right? It's like, wow, that's a lot of information. And actually the number one thing that I usually hear is like, I don't know where to cut. <laughs> okay, I don't know where to cut. I, I have some suggestions for how you can do that, but that is one of the big things that they don't know what to do. Okay, got too much information, don't know what to cut. Feedback, that's where we're at. Okay, so tips for overall, right? So obviously, there's got to be a rubric. Normally, there is some kind of rubric for a rehearsal presentation. And even if it's skimpy, they do have something that they want to prioritize to being graded for. So be sure to write down what it is, get a screenshot of that rubric or something, right? So that you have it. If it's printed, then that's great. But you should always ask, do you have a rubric? Can I see it? What does it say? What is the teacher valuing? You know, and what are they evaluating? 
if they don't have a rubric, that's okay. Your default is going to be to give feedback on the four areas that I've outlined here. This is the some this is something that we did for you guys. Remember you guys, I, I know traumatic going back to you know 299, all those oral presentations odd and you know, so he's really harsh feedback, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I it was like a preparation for this moment, right? For you to now be the person who is going to be giving assessment and feedback, right? The same thing, argument and organization, oral delivery skills, slideshow design, if applicable, if they have a slideshow, and time, which is duration. Are they doing it? Not only are they doing it within the proper time, but is it managed properly? Are they spending too much time on background, very little on their actual point? right? That's even if they make that time, that's not a good presentation, right? So it's not just time, but thinking about like the actual proportion in which they're weighing their information is going to be important. Okay. It's like a paper, same thing. You can't spend, you can't, <laughs> you know, if you have a six page paper, you spend three pages with the introduction. Uh, -uh. That's not going to work. You know that, right? But you can't do it. All right. So I'm going to start with argument organization. Why have a hook, right? Why do we have a hook? Why is that important? I remember Koa, you had some good hooks, Koa. I re <laughs> Why do you have a hook? What's going on? Um, to bring the audience in, to get them to pay attention, essentially. You're going to bring them in to start with, and then you move on to the information. It's how you gather everybody's attention. Yeah, you know, the, the way I think about it is like, uh, there, you know, I learned a lot about like the art of negotiation. And when you have like the art of negotiation, a lot of it is like you're, you're, you're not assuming that the person that you're talking to is at the same place that you are, right? Because when you're negotiating, they're at point B and you're at point A and you got to meet somewhere. And your audience, you never assume they already always agree with you. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that people have. They just assume you love my presentation, you're going to be instantly <laughs> in love with it and understand and agree with me with everything that I say. So I don't have to prove anything. Do you see what I'm saying? So when you when you start with that, um, you start with an idea that maybe they don't know about certain things that you're going to talk about. How do I get them to care? Right? Because you don't already assume that they care about it. Do you see? where is a point where you guys can all agree first and that's where the hooks come in hooks are important because they they hook you emotionally and intellectually so i and i'm not talking about the cheesy hooks i'm talking about real hooks that really help audience understand yeah i i do want to do this i care about this i'm going to pay attention right you're queuing in on things that so that they understand the relevance of what you're talking about. And this, it doesn't matter if you're talking about it in the sciences or you're talking with the humanities or social sciences, you all have to do it. It's in every single thing that I've ever read. It's in all the presentations I've ever seen. And, and, and again, you can do it really quickly. You don't have to spend a long time doing it, but it helps in terms of you connecting with that audience. I, I have to say, I think this is the one thing that our students don't do very well and they don't take seriously, but it is really important. Think about the TED Talks. Almost, I haven't seen a single TED Talk that doesn't have a hook, right? Because they never assume you already agree with them. They help you care about what they're talking about, okay? Uh, types of hooks that you can use, it could be an anecdote. I was driving the other day to work and I saw something and that made me think about this issue, right? Facts, trends or patterns, uh, you know, headlines, maybe people's general assumptions that are not true, problems that you can identify, issues that are there, that are that are concerns the field, all those things. All right, those are all kind of variations of a hook that helps connect the audience. Okay, so I would say that this is not like a top priority. There's always is things to work on with a student presentation, but I, I'm giving you this because sometimes you guys might see a presentation that seems pretty good. Like, oh, they've, they've presented their 
points and they gave their, their, their arguments and they gave their evidence. It looks solid, right? But they could always do better. What about a better hook? You know, about a better signpost, you know, all these different things. So don't settle for, it's just okay. It's gotta be phenomenal. And I want you to help them push it to that level of, it's gonna be phenomenal if you add this other element to it, okay? All right, uh, how should they articulate a clear statement of purpose, a thesis, where do you think? In a presentation. Yeah. Um, yeah, kind of just covering the like what this like presentation is about, but more importantly, like why it matters. So you're basically setting up the entirety of it, like this is what it is, and this is specifically why it matters for this audience and what's going on currently. Yeah, and you could have had a hook that says, "Here's this issue, right? Some kind of issue that's happening." And then maybe you have a statement of this is what I'm looking into or this is what I'm researching. And, 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 and then you're connecting it to that topic, right? That issue, that subject matter that you brought in or something like that. So yeah, that, that would be a way to kind of connect it all together for sure. And one thing I wanted to make sure you guys understand is that often students think that if they just read the title of their presentation, that's it. It's my presentation. Here's the title, and now you know what I'm talking about, right? That is not the thesis. A title is not the thesis. So just because they read the title, hi, my name is so and so, and I'm and my presentation's on, you know, how to give a presentation, right? That's not my thesis, right? <laughs> so don't let them do that, please, right? Students need to really clearly articulate this is what I'm covering, and this is, you know, and this is why. Right? Why does it matter? Okay. How about roadmaps and signposting in intro and presentation? How should the students provide those things? Anybody else? Koa, Koa, I know you have a lot of things to say about it. I want someone else to say something. Come on. I remember learning in the Unit 299 course the importance of like an overview because that can really like help outweigh like, okay, here's all the signposts you're going to see along the way, and then you put them in as you're going along. But they also have like a forward about that so they know to look out for them. Why are you doing that? And we're doing that so that we can organize it as in a paper, I believe, because it's like putting down your paragraphs and your specific points that are part of your thesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I have a little slideshow later on where I talk to you guys about the fact that when people hear information, they retain very little of it. Sadly, it is true. It is very true. <laughs> they do not remember. So it's all, a lot of it is like repeat, repeat, repeat strategically repeat so that they remember and they'll hear it. Um, it's not a coincidence that when you hear jingles, they repeat the jingle three times. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but you'll hear a melody three times or they'll have a phrase and they'll say it three times. And that's because that's how people remember. If you just said it one time, they're not gonna remember. Great speeches, part of uh, rhetorical devices is strategic repetition. Um, they have chorus and ballads. There's a reason for that. It's repeating, 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 a variation of the theme, right? Because that's how you remember. So, um, you know, I'm telling you guys this because one of the key elements of oral communication, because people cannot remember when they listen, is repeat, 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 right? So tell them what you're gonna tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them, right? Really basic re repetition sandwich. Right, and that's the one. And road mapping is one of the repetitions. Like, I'm gonna take you on this journey. I'm gonna take you to A, B, and C. And then, hey, we're at A. This is what we're doing. We're at B now, and now we're at C. And now I took you at A, B, and C. I know it sounds horrible. It sounds like it's boring, but believe me, when you're listening to it and you're not taking notes or anything like that, and you're not gonna reread it, that's what people are going to remember. So you wanna really do that. That's called signposting and road mapping. So roadmaps could be spoken, like briefly in a sentence, I, I am going to take you on this journey and we're going to do X, Y, Z. You can also have it as a slide where you have these points written out so they can see that as well, especially if it's more complicated, you may want to kind of lay it out so that they remember, right? Um, it can also be kind of a way to remind you as a speaker of the points that you want to make, 
right? But it is helpful. Did I tell you the story about how I make arguments, arguments with my husband, right? <laughs> I always tell my husband, I have three things to say about that. And, and, then, and then I make it up as I go. First, okay, what's the first point? <laughs> but I know I have three points, right? So it really does help to say like, I got three points and then, and then go through those three points. Uh, obviously you're not gonna make it that simple, but it is helpful, especially have a, if you have a long laundry list, um, uh, you really do wanna remind them. The fifth point of my, you know, of this, you know, kind of argument was that, you know, evidence does X, Y, Z, right? And, you know, and now I'm finished with those things. And then you move on and transition. Okay, so signpost what you will be talking about next and who will be speaking. So that's uh, more primarily for group presentations, but you guys don't, you have to remember, right? The passing of the baton. If you have multiple speakers, you don't just stop and then let the other person come in. You want to signal to your audience like you're finished officially and someone else is going to be taking your place, right? So just a, like a phrase is fine or a sentence is fine. And then obviously clearly signal when you're finishing. I, I, I really like to emphasize this because I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you're watching a presentation all of a sudden it ends. Have you ever had that? <laughs> Abruptly ends, they're like, oh, it's done. Um, and that's because they're not signaling properly, so you're not being prepared. Uh, you know, when you're reading a paper, you can see already just visually, you don't realize this. You can see, oh, it's, it's ending because there's this like blank space, right, <laughs> in the paper. There's no more left. Visually, you're being cued. But in an oral presentation, there's no visual cue. We don't know. So that signal is that you know way of telling them, hey, be prepared emotionally, pay attention because I'm wrapping things up and people will perk up more. Um, the other thing I just want to tell you guys is that I don't know if I've ever told you, well, where are we? Oh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this other story later because I I'll save it for later because it's connected to this, but but I'll I'll tell you later because um, I don't want to spill all my my stories all at once. All right, so the next point here is argument organization. How should tutors help students uh, use quality evidence to support major claims? How should you guys do this? What do you think? Especially in a presentation, either online or in person. Well, I know that for especially scientific presentations, they need to cite their sources in the actual visual Mm -hmm. Anything else? I think also just citing stuff orally um, before you say the point from the journal or whatever source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you guys are really good about being sure that they're articulating the sources that they're using either orally or in written format on the slides absolutely so a couple of things so citing sources absolutely one of the things that you want to make sure they're doing right because remember all this is done here at the university this is an academic presentation but later on if you guys go into business or whatever they're still going to want to know where are you getting this are you just making things up <laughs> where's the sources so if people still want to know you know, uh, you just want to make sure that, you know, academically, this is something that is very important, right? You can't just make things up, right? Unless it's a personal story, right? But then you're citing your personal story. Um, the other thing that you want to make sure that they're doing is that they're providing enough evidence that's explained and described. So if you have a table or chart or graph, don't let them just flash it and keep going. You cannot do that. You have to explain, what am I looking at? What's the connection with this other point? And what am I supposed to get from it, right? Um, sometimes students really think that just showing it, somehow you already understood the significance of it, but it's not enough, right? So they have to, if they use any kind of visuals, they have to stop and explain it, right? I, I, I try to tell them like, you need to talk about it and also briefly describe it like you're talking to somebody who can't see it or has like visual impairment or something like that. That's always helpful, right? Because like, so you're looking at the chart where the X, you know, X axis is doing this and the Y axis is doing that. And what it's highlighting is, so you're kind of summarizing the chart and then what's the relevance of it? That's it, right? Um, 
highlight parts of relevant evidence. That's kind of what I wanted to kind of mention and then remove any interesting but irrelevant information. So that's part of the cutting. Like they're gonna have lots of stuff that some of it may not be important. And you know, if they had to kind of cut down things, you wanna kind of cut down, the first thing you wanna cut down is stuff that's kind of interesting but not relevant. And then if they have a lot of evidence pointing, you know, towards the same point, then take the best of that, right? Take the best, right? Not, like you don't need, you know, multiple ones of it and maybe repeating the same thing, especially if we're running out of time. So oral delivery for online in-person presentation, what, did, what should the tutors look out for? This is oral delivery, so in person or online, but in particular, I mean, there's slight, slight differences. So let's talk about it in person since you guys did online before. What should you guys, what should you guys be looking for? Someone who is talking slow, but not too slow so that you're able mm -hmm. to understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Probably um, best to look out for like ums and uhs, make sure they're not saying a lot of those throughout their presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to add on to that, using their voice to really enunciate, but then also like use inflection to draw the, the listeners in, especially when you can't use like body movement. Yeah, you know, and I feel like that particular point, it's not something that I put in here is going to be particularly important now because people are giving presentations with masks. I don't know how that's good. I mean, I'm going to actually give a presentation with masks. So we'll see. I'm like an experiment, right? Like I've never given a presentation with a mask. How do you articulate clearly enough <laughs> with a mask on in a big classroom? I don't know. I mean, I know that some faculty have like little mics are students going to get get those mics? I don't know. So this is going to be interesting. I, I think things are going to evolve, but certainly I think voice and articulation is going to be really important right now with masks and giving live presentations. So that'll be interesting. Um, so eye contact. I think it, you got, you guys might have mentioned it, uh, but you know, eye contact in person is very different from online. I, I, I don't know if I've really talked a lot about it, but I usually talk about like eye contact ratio, especially in person, um, that you need to give the people a sense that you're spending majority of your time with them. Do you know why that's important? Do you guys know why that's so important? I think because it's engaging and the audience will probably get bored if you're not engaging with them. And that's one way to do it through eye contact. Yeah, so engagement, but why is that important? Um, so they can kind of like paying attention to what you're saying and they're more interested in what you have to say. Yeah, so I don't know if I've ever shared with you this chart. I have it on a worksheet, but I haven't been using this worksheet a lot, but in our class, I don't think I shared with you this chart and I'm going to just draw, I mean, I'm going to see if I can do this. Let me see if I can draw this very briefly. Um, so it's, it's, it looks like this. And this is time. It goes like this, like, you know, one minute to whatever minute of a lecture. And this is attention span, right? High attention and low attention. This is high, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is low. So this is a study that was done in the 19, late 70s on lectures and student attention. And I thought this is very apropos to oral presentations in general, because I think this is true regardless. Have you seen this chart? Did I share it with you? Um, first minute, what do you think? Where do you think the attention is? What do you, what's, what does that mean, Koa? Like really high. Um, attention probably at its highest in the first minute. Why do you think it's high? Uh, just because you're introducing yourself and there hasn't been like a long amount of time. I think like overall it'd <laughs> probably trend down uh, just because typically the longer things go, the uh, more and more attention fades. So you think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's like a downward slope. Okay. 
Do you guys all think it's a downward slope? So, so you know what it looks like? It goes like this. And it goes like that. So it's kind of like a little U, okay? So this is the first minute, really high. And then this is the last minute. <laughs> so the first minute, you're absolutely right, Koa. People's attention is super hot because, hey, someone's giving a talk. <laughs> it's brand new. I didn't know what this was about. Attention, attention, attention. You're very alert. So this is why having a hook, having a really clear thesis, an overview. Why do you think that's there? It's there because their attention span is really high. They're going to actually maybe remember at least overview content of what you're going to give. And then guess what happens? It goes down exactly as you said, because they're like, oh, you know, I'm distracted. I'm hungry. My girlfriend or boyfriend is texting me. Um, I have this issue with my cat. Uh, you, know, you know, I have homework. I have a test tomorrow, whatever. You have lots of things that you're distracted with and maybe their voice is not very animated and, you know, you're just distracted. And people, their tendency is to, to be more distracted, less attentive, they're not going to listen. They're not going to catch everything. Of course, the danger of that is that if they're not paying attention, they didn't hear the things that you have to say. So they're not going to be persuaded of anything, right? Because they're not listening, right? Because they're distracted. But then it goes back up here at the very end. You know why? It's not as high as this, right? But it is going back up a little bit. It's going back up because, oh, you're finishing. Exciting! <laughs> what, what is the point? What was the point of all this, right? So it's it's very interesting, like human nature, right? We're curious, you know, we want to know what's going on, and then they get distracted, and then it's wrapping things up. Oh, okay, I better pay attention now, right? So that's when you have your key points, you wrap it up and things like that, so they don't forget, right? So you're taking advantage of it. But what about this great big middle, this middle area here, where it drops so low, right? What are you going to do with this? So everything that we're doing in oral delivery and in slideshow design is about fighting that downhill slope. It's about fighting that attention span. So eye contact is about that. That's one component of it, which is like, how do I maintain and keep their attention? You want to engage them, but you're really fighting this battle between them deciding, like, I want to be distracted because they really want to be distracted. Right. So, so Carla, you're absolutely right. They're going to be distracted. You got to get the attention. And so eye contact is one of that. The other thing that you want to think about is the other stuff. Let me see. Ooh, do I have to stop it now? I don't know how to what is it. I have never used this before. Okay. I think I don't know if I can stop it. Let me see. I might have to stop the annotation. Do you guys know how to do this? I've never done it before. Oh, maybe I get out of it. There you go. Okay. So I talked about eye contact ratio online. Probably the ratio doesn't need to be as high, but you know, I think the more you give, the better it is. And then eye engagement, basically, there's a spread, which is like making sure that you're you're showing that you're paying attention. So the other thing is that people think that if you're watching them, they tend to look back at you. So they'll pay more attention, right? So that's what you're doing. You're kind of monitoring that, 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 that audience. Online, it's very, very difficult to do, super hard. So I just, that's one of the reasons why people like in-person teaching is that I can monitor. And you heard your faculty complain about it all the time that they can't do it, right? Um, that's because they're, they're becoming aware of this problem. The other thing is voice. So you guys mentioned this, right? Pacing. Not too slow, not too fast, but if you do too fast, people don't hear. And that's the whole point. And you know, also voice has a huge impact on whether or not people pay attention to you and that sort of thing. The pausing and the ums, strategic pausing is fine. Too many ums and all that. Why is that a problem, AJ? Because it kind of distracts from the main ideas you're trying to make if all you're saying is um and uh. The you know going to be like, oh, he's saying that a lot. Oh, uh, right. So because it, it, well, I think what you're suggesting is that it's chipping at your ethos, 
right? right. Your credibility, right? Because then they're saying, oh, are you, did you actually practice? Did you, exactly. did you do you know what you're saying? Are you prepared to t- give it? Like, and the moment that they have that skepticism and they think that you're not ready and prepared, why should I listen? Why should I care, right? You're not even prepared and you don't know what you're saying, right? It, it really chips away at that credibility. So that's one of the reasons why rehearsal is so important. You don't want people to even wonder if they should think that uh, you're not ready or prepared or, you know, at, at the very basic level, right? And obviously monotone voice, it'll kill you, right? I mean, some people have more monotone voice than others, uh, but having a conversational tone is one of the reasons why we kind of keep saying you should do that primarily because people listen to it better because it goes up and down, right? Um, it doesn't feel flat and it doesn't sound like you're reading something. That's just what is really hard with reading a script, right? Body language and gestures, we talk about this, but this is another reason why attention is up. When you use body language, you're all, you animate your voice, but it also calls attention. So motion is one of those um, uh, really important uh, factors in terms, of, in terms of design. People use motion to call attention to something. I don't know if you guys seen this, but like in TED Talks, right? Do you notice how they walk from one t- place to the other place? They're not pacing. They're not pacing. There, there are a couple of different things that goes on. When you walk to one place in a room, what happens when a professor walks really close to you? What do you do? Do you perk up a little bit? <laughs> oh, he's really close. I gotta pay attention. I'm telling you, that is the reason you do that. All right. If you are giving a presentation and talk, live and one of these days I'm going to give you a workshop and I'm going to ask you to give a work you want to do this because when you're doing that and and again not too much but usually there's a certain amount that you might want to do you want to do it strategically when you're shifting um, major points so like maybe you gave an introduction in one part of the room or in the middle and then you're giving your background information you go to the right side of the room and then maybe you have one of your argument points, you walk over to the left side of the room. So when you're shifting like major points, uh, sometimes people walk because it signals. One is like, oh, he's moving. So they're like, they, their attention span just perks up a little bit. And then it's, it's, and then you're signaling a shift in argument. So they'll pay attention more. So these are all kind of very strategic moves, which if you are interested, I'm happy to talk to you more about. I, I didn't have time to talk about it during our unit class, but you know, if you, if you take calm, you probably learn about that more as well. But it, it is like movements that you use in order to manage this, the, the, the audience. And um, it really works. So, uh, I had a lot of students who, who learned how to do this technique and who came back to me saying the professors thought they were just awesome and incredible because they were doing these like, you know, walks uh, in front of grad students. They were doing this and they were like, oh my gosh, these undergraduates are so really great speakers and they know how to manage their, their audience. So I want you to guys, I mean, now that you're going back into in-person work, uh, start thinking about how you manage space. I think with a group presentation, one of the things I, I talk about is making sure that the main speaker is at the center nearest to the screen and have them move, switch places when another person is taking that, you know, kind of focus, right? Focus speech, right? So if one if there's five people speaking and one person's talking, they shouldn't be an outlier away from the screen. They should walk towards the center and then move them down, right? So people should be taking that that center stage place when they're speaking. Okay, any questions about that? All right, so other stuff is like, you know, you know, if I were a tutor, I'd look for distracting movements or gestures, students do it all the time without knowing. And I would just make a note of it just so that they know. If you record them, you can really see it. <laughs> but if you're not recording them, you don't know. Uh, help them, if, if there's time, to make intentional gestures. And if you do, you know, um, think about where they would do that. Like, you know, you know, a high percentage or low percentage left, right, you know, things like that. Those are kind of things that help with mnemonics and help people follow with their points, okay? But if they're not needing any movements, uh, make them do a neutral position so that they're not actually moving their hands. All this, of course, is much better done if I was live and 
giving you an example. Uh, and I apologize that I cannot do that right now. Okay. The other point about this is professional appearance. We kind of talked about this, like clothing, like you just do not give your final presentation in a pair of sweats. You just don't uh, for a variety of reasons, both psychologically, but also what it says about you in terms of how much you care about that presentation and how serious you are about it. So just making sure that you're dressed appropriately, uh, making sure you think about your sound, the lighting and all that stuff if you're doing it in person. But if you're in, I mean, not online, but if you're in person, the best thing you can control is how you appear. Um, and you wanna make sure that you're appearing in a way that uh, looks like you fit the part. Um, Look, at, I mean, looking at the time here. Okay, I'm almost done with the presentation because I think I told you that I probably won't have time for the other stuff. We're just talking about feedback. I did want to go through the slideshow feedback. I, I think I I'm pretty sure I talked about this using CPR principles to give feedback on slideshows. Yes. Did I talk about that for you guys? No, we didn't talk about this. So when we talk about giving, feedback, especially for research presentations. Again, rather than having very specific, don't have a sentence on the slideshow, I'd like you guys to be guided by what is the objective, what is the goal of having information or anything on a slide. Sometimes it's better not to have anything, but sometimes it's important to have stuff. So is it to help people understand through layout and all that, that information? Is it to help persuade them? You have evidence, visual evidence to persuade them like a graph, or is it to help them remember key terms that pop in and out so that people will remember these things, right? So CPR, comprehension, persuasion, retention. I'll give you examples. So with comprehension, oh, this, this point I was gonna, I forgot about it, but this point, it was just the point that I made earlier about memory and remembering and retention, right? 80% of what people see People, re I mean, people remember 80% of what they see, 30% of what they read, and 10% of what they hear. So remember, when I say speaking, people don't remember very much. This is where it comes from. But also, just in terms of visual memory, people just remember a lot of things better. That's why slideshows, people use it. But remember, just because you put it on a slideshow doesn't mean they remember it. So how you put it on the slideshow helps them remember, right? Just putting it on the slideshow doesn't help. So you know, with comprehension, I usually just say prioritize essential information only if you can, right? Remove any IBI, that's interesting but irrelevant information, right? And just, you know, make sure that your font size kind of shows the, the importance of something. Remember you guys did that for your uh, a research poster, right? You had like three different levels of importance based on your font size. The same thing with slideshows. You want to make it consistent and have it according to importance. Um, when you're designing the slide, you wanna make sure that you're ordering it in a way to simplify and clarify whatever point you have. It should be maximizing understanding as opposed to just being there for no reason. And this is an example. I'm sorry, this, this little scribble is still there. <laughs> but this is exactly an example. This is actual real slide that I grabbed from online. It's not a great slide uh, for that reason, but but I want to illustrate like it's listing a sequence, a chronology of, of hack. It's something that was hacked, but it's not easy to follow primarily because um, this is just a lot of information and just visually it's not easier to follow. So maybe they could have done it better with a timeline, perhaps um, that might have been a better way to organize this information. This is another one that actually uses a timeline, but it doesn't do it very effectively, right? So uh, background is really hard to read. So there's a bad contrast. And also, even though it's more memorable in terms of visual sequence, it's very confusing. So you have 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 12.30, 2.30, and then you have 7 p.m. and 5 p.m. So I, you know, it's really hard to understand why they put it in this kind of sequence, but it's very difficult and it's distracting because there's too many things going on. So even if you visualize it, it doesn't mean it's done really well. So making it really clear, easy to see, 
and, and visualizing that information would have been much more effective. But that just kind of goes to show you that it's important that you consider strategically, you know, how you want to lay out the information to maximize whatever point that you want to make. Persuasion is just like, you know, you know, making sure you have evidence to point to something. And sometimes there's a lot of graphic evidence that helps you, whether it's a table, chart, you know, image, things like that, diagram, which is, this is, this is a case. Um, and this is an example of where students don't really think about it, but if you don't have a di, I mean, if you, if you want to use a diagram, there's no, you know, there's a really good way of using it. You can just cite it, just take it, but then cite the source that you got it from, right? Which is what they did here. Um, and this is another one where if you have a, like an image like this, you can add on, like you guys have done this before, like color arrows or animation in order to help people see and call attention to key, key areas. Again, this is something that is very simple, but they could just add um, to use graphics to give focus to whatever they're talking about. And the last point is just retention, um, thinking about making sure they're using harmonious colors for their slides, kind of like what you did for your research poster, use those lessons to apply to the slideshow, and then focalize key concepts, right? So in other words, like don't have too many focal points, um, try to have a, only a few if you can, so that people could pay attention to it. And you can focalize by using color, using size, where you place it, all those things are important. So this is just an example of focalization where you have a big image. Um, and even though there's a lot of text, it's very, you know, your, your quick takeaway when you glance at something like this is you know that it's about feminism. Now, what about feminism do you wanna think about? That's a whole different issue, but it carries that message really clearly visually. Okay, so I am at time. I, I think in fact, I went over. So I wanna stop right now. Um, but th there are a little bit more, oh, a couple of things more that's on the slide that you guys can take a look at that includes like presentation length and, and that sort of thing. So if that's something of interest to you, I, I do recommend like if you have time to go through it a little bit longer, I'm happy to uh, pay you guys an extra 30 minutes if you want to just run through the rest of this, the slide uh, to make sure that you understand you know, how to use, there's a form that's attached to it and some tips, and then thinking about organization of time. Okay. All right. So I know you might have to go to next, another workshop or you have another class. So I'm going to let you guys go. But if you, if you want to do that, you're welcome to do it. But, but we did cover like the major points of this slideshow. All right. Take care, you guys. Bye. So, hey, bye. Bye.